So this morning, I take our attention to Genesis chapter number 12, reading out of the New Living Translation. And this is a call of Abram, who we know as Abraham. In verse number 1, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, He said, Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, just thinking about that song we just sing, that that. Scripture hit me just a little bit different when I read it. But, hey, we're looking for a land whose builder and maker is not God. And one day that trumpet is going to sound, and I can't wait till we really see our home, our heavenly home. But he said, I want you to go to a land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. In verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that God is still blessing the entire earth through the promise given to Abraham. And then in Genesis chapter 15, verse number 1, it says, Some time later. Turn to somebody and say, Some time later. I'm thankful that God not only gives us a promise one time, but often he will reaffirm it. If it's a word from God, occasionally God has to come by and just remind us that his promises are still as valid as the first day that you receive them. So sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, he said, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, he said, oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, a leaser of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all of my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. And then the Lord just said unto him, he said, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own. Who will be your heir? And then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, He said, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. Woo! That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Oh, I feel faith in the house of God here this morning. I feel to preach on this thought. The promise is for everyone. The promise is for everyone. If you believe it's for you, put your hands together in expectation. Oh, if you believe it's for you, it's for your children. It's for all that are called according to the promises of God. Turn to somebody and say, the promise is for you. Praise God. You may be seated if you like. So what was the promise of God to Abraham? The very first book of the Bible, Genesis, we discover that the promises of Abraham were not only extended to the children of Israel, but it was extended to all generations. And as we're introduced to the person of Abraham in the Scriptures, who at the time was Abram, this was before God changed his name to Abraham. As we see Abram, we are reminded of the obedience and the Word of God and following the instructions of God. For you see, when we see Abraham, we follow him, and he begins to not only listen to the voice of God, but we see him obeying the words of God. And in his obedience, when God called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, we see that he left his hometown. He, he left his family, and he went to a land, and the land that God was going to show him. And he set out for Canaan, the, the promised land. However, if we were to read through Genesis, we would quickly discover that after he set out on that journey, he... He stopped short of Canaan. He stopped short of the promised land, and he settled in Haran. 
Yet it was from Haran, which is a place, hear me, Haran was a place below God's perfect will. It was a place below God's expectation that God spoke to Abraham again. And when he reminded Abraham sometime later, he reaffirmed to Abraham of his promise that he was going to receive an inheritance. But it wasn't just going to be a simple inheritance. It was going to be an inheritance beyond his imagination for it's no wonder that when God reminded him of this promise he he told Abraham he said I want you to come out of your tent I, I want you to come out of your small dwelling place and when you get out of the tent I want you to look up into the heavens and I want you to count the stars if you can and if you can count the stars that's how many descendants you're going to have I'm thankful that we don't serve a God that is limited, but we serve a God that flung the stars into the sky. He's the God that created heaven and the earth. Oh, hallelujah! This should give you hope. This should give me hope since God, hear me, He never stops calling us toward His promises even when we stop short on our journey, even when we settle in a place that's not His perfect will for our life, or even when we settle in a place that is below the expectation and the promises of God, even when we settle there, we still serve a God that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or even think. I'm thankful that the promises of God, they're not just to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but if you believe the Word of God, the promises in this book, they will come to pass. The promise is for everyone. Oh, turn to somebody and say, the promise is for everyone. You see, God's promise, it didn't, it didn't make sense to Abraham under his circumstances. Because Abraham, he didn't have any heirs yet. And when this promise came to Abraham, he was approximately 75 years of age. And Sarah, his wife, she was not only past the childbearing years, but throughout her life she was not able to have children. And this is one of the reasons, just one, that demonstrates the great faith that Abraham had toward God and His Word. And he not only obeyed God when he received this promise, but he fully trusted in his promises. I'm thankful for the word of God, and I pray that my life will be obedient to the word of God. But there's also something that resonates in my faith here this morning. I not only have obedience to the word of God, but I have full confidence in the promises of his word. If we will step out in faith, I have full confidence that God will perform the miraculous. It will happen. For when there was no way for Abraham to really decipher how God would bring about this promise or how God would make it happen, Abraham still obeyed and he believed anyway. And for you and me, what that means is God's promises, it, it often works the same way. And they are usually given when our circumstances or our situation they do not match what God is telling us. Our reality doesn't match the promises of the Word of God. That's when God begins to speak, and that's when God begins to confirm His Word. You see, the promises of God, they, they rarely match our reality. And that's where faith comes in. That's where faith is moved into action. For the Hebrew writer declared by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, God promises you wealth, yet you are living in poverty. God promises you healing, yet you're still living in sickness. God promises you freedom, yet you're living in the bondage of the enemy or the bondage of sin. 
God promises you hope, yet you're still living in despair. He promises you peace, yet you're still living in chaos in your mind. We read the Word of God, and the Word of God promises us joy, yet we're still living in grief. God promises you happiness, yet you come into a service like this, and you're still living in depression and oppression. God gives you a promise that He's going to give you a child, yet you're still living barren. So when your reality does not match the promises of the Word of God, what do you do? You keep believing. You keep moving. You keep expecting. Oh, I'm going to say it again. You keep believing. You keep moving. You keep expecting that the promises of God will come to pass. Oh, if you believe that, give God a mighty praise of expectation. Oh, it will happen. For the promise is for everyone. Oh, that's the beauty of the Word of God. That's the beauty of God's expectation for your life. For the beauty of God's promises is the reality that they do not have to make sense in the moment. Because God is not limited by your circumstance, and He's not limited by your resources, and He is not limited by your conditions or your surroundings. So if you have any doubt this morning, I encourage you, get out of your tent. Get out of your smallness. Get out of your limited sense of thinking. And when you get out of that smallness and you look up to the heavens and you begin to count the stars that God Almighty flung, I believe you'll have a little reassurance that God can do the impossible. Oh, He can do the impossible. When you look up and see the expanse of God Almighty, I believe you look up, you begin to realize, first of all, it gets your eyes off of your circumstance and your situation, and it gets you to focus on the one that's able to bring his power promises to pass. And when you realize that God Almighty can move and do the miraculous in spite of your circumstance, that's exactly when you can receive everything that the Word of God promises. For that's exactly what happened to Abraham. And if God can do it for Abraham, He can do it for you. Oh, hallelujah. If God did it for Abraham, He can do it for you. Oh, don't listen to the enemy. Don't listen to the doubt. For Satan is the father of lies. If he can do it for Abraham, he can do it for you. Some may say, well, that's just a story in the Bible. God did it for Abraham. But it's never happened in my life. I've never seen a miracle. I've never seen the blessings of God manifest in my life. Well, let me give you a real life, a miracle that took place in my family. And some of you have heard the miracle. I've shared it on different occasions. But there's some here today and maybe watching online you've never heard it. And I'm going to give you the, the, the brief story, the brief version of the story, the miracle. Over 40 years ago, my father, he passed away last year on September the 11th, 2021. However, 40 years prior to that, my mother was in a service and there was an evangelist and the power of God was moving and there was a prophetic service and the evangelist under inspiration of the Word of God and inspiration of the Spirit, my mother was worshiping and at the time my father wasn't living for God and this evangelist, this 
prophet of God, he looked at my mother and he said, one day, one day your entire family, your husband and your children, they will serve God with you. At the time, the circumstances did not look favorable. And after my mother received that promise, it was 30 years that that promise never came to pass. She continued to pray for my father. He never came into the church. Actually, in 1989, my father had a horrific automobile accident. And in the automobile accident, the ambulance, they took him to the hospital. And when he arrived at the hospital, he was literally DOA. What does that mean? He was dead on arrival. My mother got to the hospital. She entered into that hospital room. And the doctors came out and said, ma'am, you need to sign these papers. Your husband is dead. My mother looked at the face of those doctors and said, my husband will not die. They said, ma'am, you don't understand. We not only do not have a heartbeat, we can't even find his heart. She said, God gave me a promise that one day he will serve God. Oh, several weeks later, hear me, my father walked out of that hospital. Oh, tell me God can't perform the miraculous. Oh, somebody give God praise. If God has ever performed the miraculous for you, give God praise. Hallelujah. God spared my father's life. I don't know if I've ever shared this portion of the story, but I feel too. After that, God gave me a dream. And I believe it was God. All I seen was a bright light. And God spoke to me in that dream out of that bright light. And it said this, your father is supposed to be dead. But now it is his choice whether he wants to live or die. What I took from that, it wasn't just a physical death, but it was saying it's his choice whether he wants to live in the spirit and give his life to me. Hear me. Life is more important than the physical because when we take our last breath, we're going to stand before our creator and we need to be found in him. You would think that my father immediately came to God after that horrific automobile accident. But it was some 20 years later. Hear me, 20 years after that automobile wreck that God spared his life. That my mother did not see the promise of God come to pass. But what did she do? She held on to a promise. She kept believing she kept moving. She kept expecting. And then one day in 2018, my father in this altar repented. My father repented of his sins. He was baptized in that baptistry. And when he come up out of the water, guess what? He was praying in a language he did not know. God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The promise is for everyone. Give God a mighty praise. Give God a mighty praise. I believe it too, Brother Cavazos. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Somebody just needs to shout, I believe it. You see, God's promises, they are far-reaching. 
And the promises to Abraham had a greater reach than he could even imagine. God, thank you for letting truth reach to my family. Thank you for allowing the promise to be fulfilled in my father's life. You see, parts of God's promise to Abraham was this, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse You see, most of the time this promise is viewed in relationship to Israel, and rightfully so. But this promise had a greater reach than even Israel. For the promise did not just apply to Abraham, but Abraham's seed. And because of this, there are parts of this promise that are relevant to us today. And one of the greatest truths about this promise is this, that the greatest offspring that came from Abraham's lineage was Jesus Christ. For Jesus was the manifested Word of God. Jesus was the express image of an invisible God. He was God in the flesh. That means that Jesus, He embodied the thoughts. He embodied the words. And He embodied the promise of the Word of God. Therefore, the Abrahamic covenant, the blessings and the curses did not just apply to the way that people treated Israel, but it also applied to the way that people treated Jesus Christ. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. You see, for those who bless the Lord, not only with their praise and their worship, but they bless God with their life, the Word of God says God will bless you. But those who curse Jesus or reject His Word, God will curse them. This is why, hear me, we should never take the Lord's name in vain. Hear me, the name of the Lord should not be a byword in your mouth. First and foremost, it's forbidden by the third commandment. You want to know what the third commandment is? Just hold up a three like this. Just hold up like this, like this. Put it up to your mouth like this. You know what that means in sign language? It means word. So the third commandment is this. We need to guard the words of our mouth. We never need to take the name of the Lord in vain. What does that mean? We don't need to allow the name of God to be empty. We don't need to allow the name of God to be worthless in our mouth or use it for the wrong purpose. The word and the name of God should not be a byword. It should not be a cuss word. You shouldn't stump your toe and say his name unless you're praying under the almighty God. We don't need to take his name in vain. But there's another way we take the name of the Lord in vain. You see, when we worship God with emptiness, when we worship God with pointlessness, when we worship God with futile thoughts, when we worship God with a distracted mind, I believe we're taking the name of the Lord in vain. Hear me, Southland. When we go to God in worship, we don't need to give Him a half-hearted praise, but we need to serve God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and with all of our soul. Could somebody give God a praise that is with all their heart? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You see, when we do that, we take his name in vain. For Jesus said this to his disciple. He said, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, when the heart is emptied of the affections of God, when it's emptied of true love, true admiration, true reverence, true cherishing, 
and true treasuring. Our heart is empty and our words are vain. And the second thing that he revealed about taking his name in vain was this. He said that they make worship vain because they, they worship me, but they also teach as doctrines and commandments of men. You see, words and statements about God, they are empty of God's truth if they're replaced with human opinions. We don't need to replace the Word of God with human opinion. There's a lot of human opinions out there in our society that will say, you don't need to be baptized. That's an opinion that takes the name of the Lord in vain. For Jesus said, except you repent and are baptized, you shall die in your sin. There's other opinions out there that say there's three persons in the Godhead. Even theologians of old, they will tell you that nowhere in the Bible is the doctrine of the Trinity. What were they saying? In other words, it's interpretation of man. I'm thankful to be in an apostolic church that understands that there is only one God. And His name is Jesus. Oh, somebody shout that name. Oh, I feel praise. Oh, I don't feel empty praise here right now. I feel wholehearted praise. When our heart is empty of true affection and praise to God, we take His name in vain. But also when our words, our teaching, our preaching is empty of the truth of God, all of His thoughts, all of His words, His emotions, and all the actions are empty. All of our actions are pointless, futile, and even in vain. This is why we must worship God in spirit and in truth. You see, when we worship God in spirit and truth, we will be found in Him. And when we are found in Jesus Christ, that's when the promise of Abraham is fulfilled and it applies to you and I. Consider what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 12 and 13. And here he's writing about the power of the blood of Jesus He's writing about his blood drawing us near to God. In verse number 12, it says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Oh, I'm thankful that I'm no longer an alien. I'm no longer an outcast. But now I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. When I went down in the name of Jesus, when I was filled with His Spirit, for He continued to write in verse 19 of the same chapter, He said, Now, He said, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I want you to really grasp that if you repented of your sins, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the promise of His Spirit, you are now part of the household of God. Think about that. Your heavenly Father. If the world gives good gifts to their children, imagine what God wants to give to you in your life. The promise is for everyone. Turn to somebody and say, the promise is for you. The promise is for everyone. You see, it extends to everyone who is found in Christ. And if you are in Christ, then the promise applies to you. That means that those that bless you and bless God will bless. And those that curse you, God will curse. But thankfully, when we hear the promise that was given to Abraham, I'm thankful that it was not dependent upon Abraham. 
But the promise of God, it was dependent on solely the one that's able to bring it to pass. Consider this, eight times when God spoke to Abraham, he said, I will. He said, I will show you where to go. Not man, I will show you where to go. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Man, they can try to bless you, but there is nobody that can bless you like God. He said, I will make your name a great. I will make you a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those that curse you. I will bless all the people on the earth through you. But Abraham, the only requirement necessary to set this promise of God in motion is your belief and your obedience to move at the word of God under the unction and the power and the anointing of God. All you have to do this morning is believe and begin to obey and begin to move and you will receive every promise in the word of God. You see, Abraham, he didn't have to work it out. He didn't have to figure it out. He didn't have to make, try to make it happen. Often we try to make it happen on our own power. He didn't have to try to bring it to pass. And all he had to do was obey, believe, and all he had to do was go. And the same truth that applies to you and I with the promises of God. If it was up to us, it would never be brought to pass. But it's up to God to bring it to pass. But it's up to you and I to act in faith and obedience to the Word of God. And don't worry about the how. So often we get caught up in the how. Abraham, he really didn't get caught up in the how. At first he did, but God reaffirmed his, his word to him. So don't get caught up in the how, but just trust in the who that gives you the promise. Oh, my trust is not in the how. Oh, when my mother faced those doctors, uh, she wasn't thinking about the how. What she was putting her trust in is the who. He will live. He will not die. God gave me a promise. Oh, I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep acting. I'm going to keep praying. So if God says, I will, and if he says, I will, he will do it. He did it for Abraham, he'll do it for you. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God has not changed. He is still as powerful as he was back then. And his promises, they don't change either. So I encourage you today to be like Abraham and trust God's promises. And whether he fulfills them, hear me, in your lifetime or not, you can know for sure that God will bring it to pass. Because we often think of his promises as confined by time on, here on earth. But God is not by, bound by time. If he promises, it will bring to pass. So you can claim your joy today. You can claim your love today. You can claim the peace of God today. You can claim your healing today. You can claim your deliverance today. You can claim your freedom today. You can claim your fruitfulness today. You can claim your abundant life today. You can claim all the promises of God. That's great that he did it for Abraham. It's great that he did it for your father and your family. But what about me? I feel that the promises of God, they are dead in my life. I feel that they will never be brought to pass. 
you see the enemy, he often bombard us with those thoughts. But let me share with you another miracle that took place. Brother Jacob Garcia and Sister Hillary, they promised and gave me permission to share this. And I'm going to pull up this. She sent me this today. You see, for many years, they, they had tried for years to have a child. And for years, they did test after test after test. But every medical team and all the doctors, they said that they, they can't explain it. But they said this. They said, some people just can't have children. And that they needed to consider an alternative method like IVF or even adoption. And no further testing was needed after they shared this. They said no further testing is needed. However, they still held on to the promises of the Word of God. And back in September of 2019, there was a, a prophet, there was an evangelist that came through the church, and he, he approached Sister Hillary and he said this, he said, the Lord told me twice or maybe even three times that there's a couple in this room trying to have a child. And he said, it's you. He said, you're going to have a baby and God is going to open your womb. And then he said, I speak life. That was good enough. That was good enough. When God spoke to Abraham, it was good enough. But he settled below the expectation and the promise of God in a heron. God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to him again. And sometime later, God reaffirmed his word. So a year goes by, and almost a year, several months. And sometime later, a second prophecy came to Sister Hillary. And the word of the Lord through the man of God said this. He walked up to her and said, I speak life and just walked away. She continued to pray, and she began to claim the promises of the Word of God. But shortly after, the man of God came back to her and said this, Sister Hillary, God is going to put life into your womb. Almost one year later, God gave Brother Jacob and Sister Hillary a baby. Would you hold up live? <laughs> oh, if God gives you a promise, it will come to pass. Oh, could somebody stand to your feet and give God a mighty praise? The promise is for everyone. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, let's just give God some more praise. Go ahead, rejoice with those that rejoice. God gave them life. God gave them life. God is getting ready to give somebody life and joy here today. If the musicians would come. You can remain standing for in John chapter 16, verse 21. The Lord, before his ascension, said this. He said, a, a woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world. The trouble... The trial, can I say it this way, the pregnancy of the promise of God that you're going through 
when it comes to pass, you're going to forget about the trial. You're going to forget about the trouble. You're going to forget about the pain. When the joy of the Lord is brought to pass, you're going to forget about your struggle. But what was God really referring to? He was referring of his death, burial, and his resurrection that would follow. For after this, Jesus, he not only gave up his life, but he was buried. And he was resurrected to the disciples' joy. And hear me, Jesus appeared to them for approximately 40 days, walking among them, teaching them, and and preaching and caring with them before he ascended into heaven. Yet before he left, Jesus did not leave them grief-stricken or without a promise. But he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to send another comforter to you. I'm going to send my spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost was poured out on everyone that believed. And they were filled with joy. You and I, we've never seen Jesus face to face. But as believers, we have an assurance that one day we will see him face to face. If we obey like Abraham, if we repent of our sins, we're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, one day we will be with the Lord again. And how can we be with him in heaven? That plan is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. It says, And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be yet baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how every individual, individual, every generation will be blessed. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The Apostle Paul said it in these words. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, he said, He said, For Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing, somebody say blessing, of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hallelujah. What I believe is getting ready to happen, if you need to be renewed in the Holy Ghost, you're going to be renewed in the Holy Ghost. If you believe what I just preached, and if you'll come to this altar and repent with all of your heart, and decide, you know what, I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus, this promise will be fulfilled in your life. You shall receive the promise of the Spirit of God. You'll begin to speak a language you've never spoke before. Today is the day of Pentecost. Every individual that's never experienced that, if you desire it, you're getting ready to experience it. But also, I believe if you need healing in your body, you can receive healing today. You can receive the promises of God. If you need greater joy in your life, you can receive it today. If you want to be delivered of addiction and oppression today. Today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you lift up your hands? Today you can be delivered. Hallelujah, today. Today you can receive it. If you need a child today, God can birth that life into your womb. If you need wealth, God can bring you out of poverty. The peace of God is here. And the peace of God is getting ready to be released. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I want everybody... How many has a need here? You, you really have a need. Every, somebody, you lift up your hand high. How many wants to receive the promises of God's Word? How many wants to be in heaven? 
Every hand should be lifted. Because that's the promises of God. I'm going to ask everybody to come to this altar. Everybody. We're going to have a time of prayer together. We're going to pray corporately. Some may have never, and I feel this strongly, some has never come to the altar. But I would encourage you, just come. You're going to pray by yourself. We're going to pray individually but collectively. But it's going to give you a time just to lift up your hands and call on God. I need everybody to just kind of press in here to the altar. Hallelujah. Get as close as you can to the altar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. If you have a need, if you want the promises of God, come into the altar. I know this. for some this is a step of faith. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. I understand some, they, they can't stand long. If we could reserve, if we could just, let's get as close as we can. Reserve maybe that front row for our elders that need to sit. I would even encourage them to come forward and, and sit close to the altar, as close as you can. What I believe God's promise is God's getting ready to open the windows of heaven. And he's going to pour out a blessing upon each and every one of us. How many believe that? I believe it. I know it. I know it. I know it. So we're getting ready to pray. And if you feel comfortable, I just want you to lift up your hands in expectation and say, God, I believe your word. Hallelujah. Just talk to God. Let's, let's pray together. God, I believe your word. I believe that the promises that were delivered to Abraham was to every generation. And God, I believe it's for every individual that is here today. And God, I believe that you're going to open the windows of heaven. And I believe, God, that you're going to fulfill your promise. Those that need to be renewed in the Holy Ghost, I believe you're going to refill them with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Now I want you to begin to lift up your voice in expectation and begin to praise God. Yes, yes. Begin to praise God for it. Say, God, I believe. I believe.